Today in Tech Short Foundations, we're going to help you make sense of EC2 for your HPC workloads. Let's get started. You can get your compute from AWS using a really large range of services, most of which are specifically focused on certain tasks. Lambda, for example, runs your code that you deploy as short-lived subroutines. ECS and EKS provide management of container resources, so you can abstract away the day-to-day -day management of containers and turn this task into repeatable motions, which are managed, tracked, and supported. AWS Batch, which is one of our two most commonly used HPC orchestration tools, uses these container services. We'll talk more about Batch in depth in another TechShorts Foundation video soon. But today we're going to go down a layer or two and focus on EC2, which is our way of providing virtual servers in AWS. So first some terminology. You'll hear us use these names a lot, so it's worth defining them. An instance is a virtual server delivered to you over the network by either the click of a mouse or in a web browser. Uh, or kicked off by command line or API call. You can spin one of them, dozens of them, or thousands of them up if you need to. Instances have specific properties, which you'll have chosen when you figured out which one you wanted. We use virtual machine technology embedded in hardware so that we can deliver a virtual server really quickly, typically in a couple of minutes or less. Amazon machine images, or armies, are the things that instances boot from. Think of them as pre-configured templates for your instances that package the bits you need for your server to do something. They contain an operating system and additional software as you need them, and they can even be created by image builder pipelines, so they're always automatically up to date. You'll grab them on the fly from our instance repositories in AWS Marketplace. This is the source of all the authoritative armies from AWS and our trusted partners like Red Hat, Canonical, Debian, and so forth. You might grab them also from the community army repo, which you're free to pull from and contribute to. And since you're an HPC person, we have to talk about vCPUs and cores. We have hyperthreading turned on by default for nearly all of our instance types. So in 99% of cases, when you see us talking about vCPUs, you can pretty much take it to the bank that we're talking about hyperthreaded cores. So the C5N instances, for example, have 72 vCPUs in the largest size available, but it's a box with 36 physical cores. So that means two vCPUs per core, which is exactly what you'd expect with hyperthreading turned on. We're not shy about this, and we do give you the ability to turn it off, but I want you to understand exactly what we're talking about. There are two exceptions to this rule. Our HPC specific instances right now, that's the HPC 6A, and all our Graviton instances. The HPC 6A instances, because, well, we know it's not helpful in HPC. And the Graviton instances, because Graviton, which is our ARM-based processor, just doesn't have hardware threading as a feature. But we'll keep calling them vCPUs in our documentation. It's just that in these cases, a vCPU maps to a physical core. Sorry if that sounds like fine print. If we need to split hairs, we'll say vCPUs and remind you that we don't mean physical cores. Now we've mentioned the words virtualization enough that your HPC spider senses are tingling and you're wondering whether there's a virtualization tax on performance when you use these awesome EC2 things. The good news is no. And that's because we've spent several years shifting all the hypervisor functions out from the operating system and into bits of hardware that live in specifically designed boards in our physical server boxes. All this comes under the banner of a hardware system we call AWS Nitro. This graph shows the performance difference on Nitro-enabled virtual machines, the ones you have access to right away, and bare metal hardware with no Nitro. There's practically no difference. It's less than half a percent. And these are real HPC codes, the kinds that scare small children and fully grown computer science professionals. Anyhow, the notion of a performance penalty from using virtual machines on AWS, that's seriously done with. If you want to know more about Nitro, here's a link to a talk. But if operating system theory and single root IO virtualization isn't your thing, you can safely move on and still live a rich, full life. OK, let's talk about names. This is an EC2 instance name in the wild. You'll see a lot of these, and at first glance, they look like a jumble of letters. But there is some rhyme and reason to them. The first letter, C, that's the instance family. C series instances are our compute optimized ones. They come with around four gigabytes of RAM per physical core, 
uh, some snappy networking, and usually higher end processor bins from the chip makers. The six here is the generation number. The higher the better, as you'd imagine. The next two letters after the six mean that this specific C6 packs an Intel Xeon, I is for Intel, and has some fast local disk attached, that's the D. In this case, consulting the specs on the web, fast local disk is an NVMe SSD. Those are really fast. If this instance had an AMD processor, it'd be a C6A. If it used one of our own ARM-based CPUs, the AWS Graviton, it'd be a C6G or a C7G because we launched the Graviton 3 earlier this year. But there's other letters denoting extra features. If you see a Z or Z after the generation number, that's a high frequency CPU. Think four gigahertz and a smaller number of cores. And the N means high bandwidth, usually at least 100 gigabits per second. The final part of the name is the t-shirt size. It really does just go from large to extra large to 2x large, etc. In this case, it can go all the way to 32x large. And no, I don't wear shirts that big either. But pause the video and study this chart for half a minute. You'll notice a pattern, and you'll probably realize that each instance size we offer is basically a slice of a full server all the way up to the largest size, which you can usually safely assume is the whole box. Since you're an HPC person, it's probable that you'll run your production workloads on a whole box. And in fact, you'll stitch multiple whole boxes together to run your tightly coupled MPR jobs. So these smaller instance types are useful to you probably for admin roles in your workflows or smaller jobs. They're also great for development systems. If you have a big day of compiling ahead of you, trust me, a 64 core desktop is a beast. Now, now you're, you're ready, ready to make sense of the whole slab of the EC2 alphabet soup. And you understand what we mean when we say instances, cores, and families. The T instance family is, well, it's T for tiny. They're sometimes good for head nodes on clusters when you know that the head node isn't gonna see much action, but they're really, really cheap, and that has a place. M is for medium, and in fact, M6 instances have pretty much all the same processes as the C6s, but they have twice as much memory per core as the Cs do. Ms get used for general purpose stuff in enterprise environments usually, which turns out to mean memory hungry. C is for compute optimized, and we spoke about them already. These are your mainstream, I need something fast with the usual amount of memory per core. R instances have lots of RAM. Uh, they're 16 gigs per core. Now, while we're here, X instances are a thing too. X means extra RAM. And these suckers have terabytes of RAM. Uh, they're for very specific things that you might need them for from time to time. Keep this in your back pocket. Into the accelerator zone we go. And there's G instances for graphics. These are what you'd expect to use if you needed fancy graphics processing capability, which definitely comes up in HPC. The P instances are for performance GPUs, like all the ones that Nvidia makes that the world is currently training all of its models on. Yes, those ones. And we can't finish without mentioning I, D, and H instances, which all have large numbers of either hard drives or SSDs attached to them. So customers can build up stacks that do insanely optimized IO on node and really close to the CPU. We use these things for building Lustre file systems for you. You could run them, you could run really fast NFS filers or IO intense data processing workloads. Now, no discussion of EC2 for HPC people is complete without bringing up the HPC 6A, the first instance in an HPC specific instance family. HPC 6A is built on AMD's Epic Milan processor. As we alluded to earlier, there's no multi-threading, so that means it's 96 physical cores, all of which can run at 3.6 gigahertz. Four gigs of RAM per core is standard for most HPC applications, and 100 gigabits of EFA means you're not going to have a hard time at all scaling your codes on, the, on clusters of these. It's two thirds lower cost than anything comparable in EC2. So depending on how you choose to buy them, you can, you, they can cost as little as 1.6 cents per core hour, uh, but even without any commitments, three cents per core hour on demand is a super low price to be able to just test an idea quickly. We'll talk about HPC 6A in more depth in, you guessed it, another Tech Shorts Foundations video. But for now, pay some attention to the fact that not every AWS region has every instance type. The HPC 6A is available in a selected set of regions only. 
We'll also talk more about EFA in another Tech Shorts Foundation video soon, because it's quite a big topic. But there's a few things to notice for now, though. Remember that EFA just plugs into your existing code without you needing to do anything special. It's a libfabrics provider, so OpenMPI, Intel MPI, and MVAPitch just see EFA and run with it. Next, we're a long way from 2018 when we launched EFA, when C5N was the first and only instance for a while that supported it. Most of the deep learning model training customers do on AWS now happens on vast fleets of P4 instances with 400 gigabits of EFA across petabits of backplane with honking large numbers of GPUs. In late 2021, EFA, well, it's pretty much mainstream now, and it turns up all over the place. Almost any instance type we launch now has EFA built in, though not always with 100 gigabits. The C6i comes with 50 gigabits, for example. The list just gets longer every month. So I'll leave you with a link to this page that lists all of them, and in fact, provides you a script that you can use to get the latest list anytime you like. That's, so that's it. EC2 in a nutshell for HPC folks in under 12 minutes. If you got something out of this video, please click like and consider subscribing to the channel so you can find out about any of the new videos we're creating in the similar series.